Yeah, so my name's Rufus. Um, I'm from England. I grew up in London. Um, and I now live in the north of England for the last 18 years. Um, and I work as a psychologist in um, the British health system. Um, three and a half days a week, I manage inpatient psychology um, in uh, acute wards. And um, I'm very passionate about holistic approaches to mental health, kind of creative approaches to mental health. Um, and what gets seen as perhaps extreme uh, mental health problems or extreme states of distress or confusion. Um, and that's rooted in my own experiences. Um, at 18, I, uh, for want of a better word, uh, had a breakdown um, and had some powerful beliefs. Um, they kind of changed and evolved and shifted. Um, but for example, I believe that I could be an apprentice spy, uh, that I was a, my work was actually a front for a spy agency. Um, and rather than being in a really boring job, I was actually um, being rooted for and being tested to see if I could be a, a good young 007 in a sense. Um, so I thought I was uh, being tested and being given packages to deliver that were, were going to be difficult. And um, I had to be creative how I showed that I had the, the, what it takes to be a spy. And I thought I was working for MI5. Um, yeah, so I had these kind of beliefs and I had some powerful spiritual beliefs as well um, that I could kind of get a hotline to God through uh, randomly looking in a Bible, but then randomly looking um, in other places too, like even a driving uh, manual. Um, so I got very sort of obsessive about finding meaning in my life. Um, and, and that ended up bringing me to the attention of psychiatry. Um, and because there was a um, my grandfather, I think, was given a diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, and my auntie as well on the same side of the family. Um, so to, psychiatrists were very um, keen to frame my problems um, as schizophrenia, um, and I was told I'd have to take powerful medication um, for the rest of my life. And um, I didn't find the medication. I found it caused as much problems as it um, as it, any help it gave me. Um, it felt like it created more problems. I felt, um, yeah, there were a lot of difficult effects, um, and so eventually I managed to come off medication. Three times I tried to come off medication. Um, twice I ended up back in hospital, but the third time I managed to come off and stay off medication. Um, and I felt disappointed really that, that although there were some good things going on in the psychiatric system in general, I felt it wasn't the kind of help I would like to have had. And I didn't feel people really listened to me respectfully. I felt like I was treated a bit like um, a second rate citizen and that my beliefs were not entertained at all they were just dismissed as severe mental illness and I found that really disrespectful um, and I I found I thought they were kind of rich and meaningful um, and but no one seemed to want to listen to that in in services and indeed even a year later when I tried or a year or two later I tried to get counseling counselors were like oh no we don't you know we don't want to um, rock the boat you know if you've had psychosis we don't want to sort of open that can of worms so I ended up um, I was I ended up training um, to be a psychologist for 10 years later um, so it took me some time um, and really wanting to promote the ideas 
but, but it's really important to listen to people and to treat them as equals. Um, and I guess I came face to face at 18 when I was in psychiatry and diagnosed and medicated, sometimes against my will. I came face to face with this quite apartheid approach that we have that we kind of dismiss people uh, who we see as mad. And perhaps our society, um, you know, the holy grail of our society, of modern society, industrialized society, is rationalism. So people who are irrational are really undervalued because, because it's, it's not rational and, uh, and, uh, and have historically been shunned, um, you know, locked up behind closed doors. So there's a lot, there's a lot of shame around that, not only perhaps because people are seen as being without reason, but also perhaps historically mainstream religion could could be quite damning of of mad behavior and present it as, as you know possession and so there's a lot of fear about the dangerousness of madness that still gets still gets promoted by the media that kind of ancient folklore in a way or the the, the mad person is is immoral and bad and i i felt i kind of experience that stigma that discrimination that that position in society uh, but i felt it was a complete myth that, that, that i i really valued some of the people i met in the mental health system and and i thought the doctors were a bit crazy some of them <laughs> you know so that it, it wasn't so uh clear cut that there were these sane people and there these mad people uh, but actually um it it was a lot i had a much more inclusive model in my head and i remember really finding it helpful when a friend came to see me and he said i don't think you're mad you're just a bit paranoid and i thought well, yeah that's that's really like rather than being told i had this severe mental illness that made and that was, I was my brain was fundamentally different to the extent it required lifelong really strong medication i preferred my friend's diagnosis that i was just a bit paranoid um, <laughs> felt felt like you know uh, I there was more connection there and belonging in in that framework. Um, so yeah, I've been working now qualified for about twenty years, um, probably more now um, in the mental health system and outside. Um, I co-facilitate a hearing voices group in Bradford and that's something I do voluntary. Um, so, so working inside and outside the system, um, really passionate about, yeah, if we want to do things differently, how can we do them as communities and, and as helpers if we're in that role, um, whether it's professionally or as friends or, or, or relatives. Um, so yeah, I just want to share in the hour we've got, and then we've got some time for questions, some some ideas and reflections about what we call delusions um, and what might run from that about how we might be helpful um, if we're with somebody who, who seems to be holding on to the belief really strongly that we, we don't understand or we find challenging. Um, yeah, so I've got a few slides. Um, there is a chapter on my website on rufusmay.com called Accepting Alternative Realities that also gives you more reading um, on this and shares more ideas and reflections. Um, so I'm going to start with a, uh, a Buddhist idea that Buddhist, I quite like this when I heard this. The Buddhists think we've all got delusions. So rather than being this, this taboo group of people who, who have delusions, actually we all, none of us see the true nature of reality, that we all have overvalued ideas. And in fact, we need them to negotiate the world. We need maps. But those maps aren't always accurate. Uh, in fact, they probably rarely are. Um, so we, we all hold um, beliefs. 
uh, that can be delusion, seen as delusional. And uh, what they try and do is, is create um, practices, grounding practices like meditation, uh, mindfulness, to um, step back from those beliefs and in some ways to get closer to, to reality. Um, but that, that contrasts strongly with the Western uh, view that, that there's a um, there's a correct one right way to see the world and you'll get that in law as well that idea is very strong in our society that there's a right way and a wrong way or many wrong ways um, there's one truth and that science modernist science has kind of argued that if we could just understand things and, uh, then we can create progress but since atomic physics and um, people like Einstein and Heisenberg, postmodern thinkers have argued that actually is not one superior view. There are many well, possible realities and different perspectives. And actually, it might be better rather than to try to hold up one reality as the ultimate version of reality, one, one story, to um, respect these different versions of reality and create dialogues between them. And that might be what's healthy for a modern global uh, world, global society, is that we have a multicultural um, environment where we don't try and make everyone think the same thing, but, but learn from each other's different perspectives. Um, So we move away from an idea that um, there is a best way to see the world. Um, so you'll get in mental health circles, people say, well, do they have insight? And that almost implies that there's, there's a best way to see the world and that this poor deluded person doesn't have insight into the right way of seeing the world. Um, but uh, actually, you, even even the most rational person, it's just a map they're using to to um, look at the world. It's not it's not the territory. It's not reality. So we want to uh, perhaps think about that. And um, if we if we're probably the group of people here listening, you know, if we're all in a room and we start to talk about global politics, we'd find there are different versions of reality in the room very quickly, or, or spirituality, or religion, um, or gender politics. You know, we'd start to um, find, you know, even if we did it really respectfully, we'd, we'd find there are different versions of reality in the room. And, and so we, um, perhaps sanity is not about whether you see the world world in the right way but actually how do you navigate your own versions of the world with other people I think often in in communication we're, we're trying to find common ground with each other so if I have a friend who's who's got different political beliefs than me I'm going to probably skirt around that if I want to have a good time with him uh, in, in I'm probably going to focus on how we might understand Jungian ideas if I'm thinking of one particular guy a friend of mine who, who has very conservative views and uh, is very royalist and um, sometimes I'm interested in what he's got to say about that and sometimes I laugh but actually there are other things we have a, a, in common that, that I tend to focus on it when we when we do things together um, so yeah, I'd like us to move away really from the idea that um, delusions are fixed, but actually they're negotiated. I can think of several people I, I've come across recently who are from, um, from Muslim families, but having Christian beliefs and the family think they're psychotic. So that just shows um, how, how rel relative our beliefs are. If, if our environment doesn't accept our beliefs, then um, we've got a problem. So if we can persuade people around us of our belief, that our beliefs have legitimacy, we, 
we can we won't be dismissed as as psychotic or mad so there's something about also our environment can our environment accept our different viewpoint can we might not always be about helping people be brilliant navigators but also how can we create more accepting environment that that can accept people's different beliefs um yeah so like in the hearing voices group somebody says uh somebody says that they believe their voices are demons um we respect that that's their understanding um if we if push comes to shove i might in a conversation would say i i agree to disagree with you but i respect his belief and 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 appreciate how how difficult that must be living with those experiences um, I, I try to appreciate try to empathize with how frightening that could be um, so i think if we're supporting somebody with powerful beliefs i think i'll talk a bit about my own beliefs i don't want to get too caught in the slides um, but if we're going to support somebody um, who has different beliefs to us um, and we we find them worrying those beliefs we might want to hold it might be good to also hold our beliefs more likely we might need to change how we think about things too um, um, but I, I think I was reading Ron wrote a blog about this that, that often when people hold beliefs really rigidly so uh, if somebody believes for example um, that they're better off dead, uh, they need to go to another dimension to help everyone. Um, I could react really sort of rigidly to that and say, no, no, you've got to believe the way I think, see things, or we need to medicate that belief out of you. And actually that's not going to be helpful. If we can, we might panic if we hear somebody talking about a belief that seems really challenging. Um, but it might be more useful to say, well, when when did you when did you find life worth living? When when were you not so absorbed by the need to get out of this world? And that might be an opening. Um, but we need to then uh, relax a bit to be more creative like that. Um, we need to not hold on to our worldview so rigidly to be curious about the other person's experiences of life um yeah i think i'm going to go back to my own experiences i'm a little bit uncomfortable with talking about other people's beliefs too much um i, I want to think carefully about how i do that um in order to honor their experiences so um just to illustrate a bit about, I think the complexity of beliefs, but also the potential meaningfulness of beliefs. So um, what had happened in my life um, was that I was 18. I felt a tremendous pressure to, to become um, an independent adult and to achieve something. And I kind of underachieved really over the years. I hadn't done very well in school and academia, as I was not as well as I was expected to. And um, I, I had a girlfriend, first kind of girlfriend really, uh, when I was 17. And um, that had been very exciting for me, uh, being in a, a relationship, um, a sexual relationship and a, and a romantic relationship is is very, uh, meaningful for me and then when that ended I felt quite empty and I, I felt a, um, a lack of connection with friends a lot of my friends um, were people I'd smoked dope with and they um, I didn't want to hang out with them so there was a kind of vacuum really um, so I was quite lonely um, the, my closest friend Looking back, she she was away. Um, she got, went travelling, and it, so in that void, 
you could see why I might start to perhaps create another world for myself where I felt some belonging and some, some meaning and purpose. Um, I'd also got quite depressed when I was about 15, uh, 16. Uh, and I'd, maybe perhaps my psyche didn't want to go there. Uh, didn't want to go to some sort of dark, sort of suicidal place. And that it was almost like the imaginative child part of me. Um, so you see children sort of under the age of five, they can create these rich worlds that they can totally be immersed in and believe in. And, and, and um, it's almost like that part of me that could fantasize uh, came out to protect me and say, you know, instead of this bleak, depressing reality, how about this? How about you're an apprentice spy? How about the world's a lot more mysterious and science, some of those science fiction books you've read you know, are, are actually based on reality. So um, I, I, so the world became very dreamlike in a way. Um, and perhaps it was to rescue me from this, this sense of anomie, this sense of uh, not, not belonging, this sense of loneliness, uh, alienation. Um, and also I think there was the emotional loss of, of my first girlfriend that I really wanted to get back with her, uh, back together with her. Um, and I wonder now if the reason I found it difficult to deal with that breakup was uh, it kind of opened the key to earlier emotional losses for me. Um, so when I was 11, my mother had a brain hemorrhage um, and she was uh, disabled physically and mentally and she did make a strong rehabilitation recovery. Um, but she was never the same as the person before she had the brain hemorrhage. Um, so, and I don't know if I really dealt with the grief of that. Um, so you could see my school performance and went down after, from the age of 12. So it clearly had a big emotional impact on me. Me and my mother fought quite a lot in my teenage years. And um, so perhaps the, the loss of my first girlfriend, uh, that breakup, undid the key to some emotional conflict and distress that I'd never really processed. And whoosh, it all came up and, and, had, and had this kind of uh, powerful desire to reconnect with her and this, this powerful, I mean, they say that in grief, an important part of grief is, is that for many people, stage you go through is denial. And I got really into that perhaps, that, that we were gonna be reconnected. So one of my ideas was I needed to find the safe house where my girlfriend and I would be reunited, that she was actually a spy for the, the Russians and I was a spy for the British and we were gonna be re, re, reconnected and I had to find a safe house. Um, and just stepping back from the narrative of this, that in a way this symbolized attention for me that I was, I was aware of a cultural tension. So my girlfriend was from an African Caribbean background and I was from a white background and both our parents didn't, weren't supportive of the relationship. And I thought maybe that's to do with cult, race and culture and racial prejudice um, on both sides maybe. I, um, I'm not, uh, I don't think my parents would agree, but at the time, that's how I thought, you know, maybe this is why this relationship didn't work out. Um, and um, so, yeah, this, in my delusional world, um, it was very much about the Russians and the British, the communists and the capitalists. And I'd, I'd worked out that some of my friends were communists and they were really kind, but a bit boring. And some of my friends were capitalists and they were quite exciting, but 
bit selfish. And I, was, I wasn't sure which side I wanted to be on. So there was, there was something about, there was about identity, um, but also perhaps it symbolized this cultural tension I was aware of. Um, and um, I think, I think where you feel, where you grow up in, in environments where the beliefs are quite rigid, then, then there is a tendency sometimes to rebel. And I see that quite a lot of work, people rebelling, coming up with new beliefs um, to, to perhaps escape that reality. Um, yeah, so that's, a, that's an example. And what I guess I'd have liked is people to be curious and to look for links between my beliefs and my experiences if I was up for going there. But people didn't really, people just saw it as word salad, my beliefs, that they were uh, products of a, a completely faulty mind um, that was you know, genetically flawed and that I was going to degenerate. And I, I still see that now. Now I've heard stuff say, oh, isn't it a shame that young man's you know, got psychosis? So there's this kind of, everyone gives up around it and definitely isn't curious about what's going on for the person. So what I'd like to promote is a lot more curiosity and open-mindedness and actually maybe we can learn from people's beliefs once people, if people want to, to look at the meaning, meanings of them, potential meanings. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the slide presentation um, yeah so I think I've already talked a bit about this but the, perhaps we need to understand that beliefs are protective so psychiatry and sometimes even psychology can be be targeting a challenging belief a belief we find challenging if somebody believes that they're Jesus or they believe that they're uh, persecuted uh, by the government we think we've got to get rid of this belief with the, the cognitive strategies or with medication and yeah, but but beliefs are there for a reason you know we create beliefs to make sense of things and so we need to go carefully if we're going to think about um, wanting that person to change their beliefs we should, we need to tread carefully and perhaps honor that but the belief is protective. Um, so, yeah, it might be hard to see how a belief that, that somebody needs to die is protective, but, but that might be um, perhaps, say, if somebody believes that they're, they're not of this world, they're an alien who, and they need to kill themselves um, to do. To, to, have their true life in another dimension. Um, that might protect them from the, the, the blame, the terror, the way we frame suicide in, in, our, in our society is that it's, it's a terrible thing and it's sinful and it's immoral. And, and this creates a narrative that actually you can get peace from this world and um, go into another world um, to do good. So it can be an alternative framework that can protect people. Um, I guess what, what I'm interested in is how can we make the world, um, if beliefs are distracting people from distress, how can we make the world around them less distressing, you know, more worth connecting with? Um, one thing to do in hospital is um, dance sessions. So we just have dance, where we have some music and freestyle. Anyone can dance. People choose what music goes on and I'll dance constantly and people can come and join me. Or we do drumming. Um, so find, uh, giving people experiences of, of the joy that you can get in life. Um, and perhaps away from talking about problems and uh, which has its place, but also how can we move our bodies and reconnect with it, music and life? Um, okay. Mm. 
Now, I think it's important again not to dismiss beliefs as just being psychotic. I'm, I'm probably preaching to the birthed totally, but um, <laughs> there's, there's examples of this, I guess, that beliefs have links to people's lives. And, uh, there's lots of research, see my paper I referred to earlier, for example, but there's lots of research showing that persecutory beliefs don't come from a vacuum. You know, um, people have had real experiences of persecution. Probably most of us get paranoid now with the internet and stuff. I mean, um, some, somebody asked me the other day to, to tell them what was going on. Um, there's been some conflict in, in one area my work and somebody asked me about it on the internet I was like I'm not going to type this down <laughs> I think that's quite common you know, we, we do have uh, cookies and all sorts of things surveying how we um, consume and um, it's healthy so but yeah persecute where people have strong paranoia strong beliefs that they're being persecuted you can guarantee they've had that real in real life and one way I've got a looking at that is that Paranoia might be like a flashback. So a flashback is um, like a memory, but it's so powerful, the memory. It might be the emotions, it might be fragments of your mem memory, it might be the emotions or it might be the sounds or uh, the, um, the smell, but it, the memory is so powerful, it feels like it's happening in the here and now. That's what characterizes a flashback. And I wonder if quite a lot of paranoia is the, the emotional content of the persecuted experience is coming up. It's so powerful, you, it's like a lens through which you see the world and then you see the world as, as, as persecuting you. Um, so, um, yeah, if, maybe I'll come to, come to that, but, you can use, if people are motivated to, you can use perhaps uh, psychological approaches to flashbacks to help people. So um, I'll say it now in case I forget later. Um, if somebody um, finds this way of thinking about their paranoia helpful, they can create a mantra to say to themselves when they're feeling paranoia, they could say, you know, it's actually, uh, Babette Rothschild talks about this in her book Eight Keys to Safe Trauma Recovery. You can create a mantra saying it's 2020, I'm, I'm 51, um, I'm safer now. So you can create some kind of man mantra to tell your younger parts of you that are re-experiencing this, this fear, this terror. Um, and with a lot of people who experience this, say at night time, for example, a lot of people I, I see get a lot of fear, fearful in, um, ex thoughts and experiences at night time um, because bad things have happened to them as a child at night time. They can um, perhaps say this mantra, but also do something to show that they're now in a safer place. So I, I often suggest quite dynamic things like boxing, shadow boxing, like doing 100 punches and saying, it's 2020, I'm safer now. Um, and they, that can help the younger parts feel safer and, and, and let go of the, the fearful memory or perhaps begin to process it in another way. Um, so beliefs, yeah, I've put in the second part of this slide, they're like dreams and they can symbolize powerful relationship dynamics and cultural dynamics. Um, I've already talked about my belief um, about East and West and the conflict and how that might have reflected the relationship with my girlfriend. Um, so I think, yeah, we just need to be honoring and curious about that. And, I've worked with people who've got cross-generational trauma and perhaps sometimes the beliefs that might represent um, things that have happened in previous generations. So for example, the Holocaust, 
um, there's there's evidence that grandchildren of children of, of the Holocaust can have nightmares and um, about the Holocaust that their grandparents have never talked about, and so stories can get passed across generations without even being talked about. And, um, so I think we also need to be open to that not always just have a pure trauma focus but also think about how this fit in with what, what parents or grandparents might have experienced um one person i worked with felt that people were being disappeared and that would have happened to her her dad in the gulags and um for example so how can we be with somebody who has a strongly held belief um, what's the best way to be? Um, I think mindfulness is really useful. Um, I found that when I'm grounded and practice some mindfulness, um, that I can be less defensive myself and, and more open-minded and, and better at being present and empathic. Um, I think uh, being really honest um, because obviously if somebody else has a belief that's quite disturbing, for example, we can panic and we can get, and people pick up on that. So, but if we can do some grounding work and be very present, that could be really helpful. I think there's a wind horse project in America um, where they, they, they support people going through um, psychosis, whatever we want to call it, you know, powerful experiences and, and each, practitioner has to have their own mindfulness practice whether it's yoga or meditation um, and to be very grounded when they're around people so just being with somebody um not trying to fix everything just trying to be be present be connected um and um yeah empathy is a big, big one so um, time I'll stop in about 15, 20 minutes so we can have some questions. Um, empathy can go out the window. If somebody's saying bizarre things. So at one point I believed I had a gadget inside my chest that could be used to control me. So that was shortly before I got hospitalized the first time. I started to get chest pains and I started to think that enemy forces had put a gadget inside my chest. Maybe my girlfriend had given it to me in a in a really nice sandwich, he used to make these really nice sandwiches with um, avocado and cheese and mayonnaise. And, and I thought maybe that had contained this bug that had got lodged in my chest. Um, and um, where am I going with this? Ah, how to be with this. So when I told the GP, she looked concerned and said, um, I'm going to refer you to a specialist, which I thought a chest specialist, um, but it was actually a psychiatrist. Um, what would have been helpful is somebody to say, gosh, I'm not sure that's happening. You know, I think you could be stressed and it could be stress um, that's creating muscle tension in your body. Um, but if I believe what you believe, I'd be terrified. You know, I'd be really frightened. That would have been so helpful for somebody to empathize with me. So empathy doesn't mean we're agreeing with somebody. If we just say that sounds really frightening for you, we're not agreeing with somebody. So there's a gen big fear in psychiatry, mental health services of colluding with somebody. And so people don't often go to empathy because they, they're afraid that they're going to be reinforcing the beliefs. But actually, that's a great connecting tool. Um, to help someone feel safe and, and something I've used sometimes I've got caught in trying to disagree with somebody they've got a disturbing belief that they've got a gadget inside them and I've been saying no 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 it's not logical where's the operation scars blah, 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 blah. and we just get into more and more disagreement and uh, less connection and when I've actually said you know what if I if I believe what you believe I'd be absolutely you know breaking it I'll be really frightened that might not be culturally translating very well. I'd be really frightened. 
and, and see the person then relax because they feel heard on an emotional level. Um, finding common ground, so that if we stick to what we disagree about, we miss that opportunity for, for connectedness uh, that can come from finding common ground with people. Um, and yeah, can we ask curious and open-minded and creative questions? Can we, and can we hold lightly our own ways of seeing the world? That will help as well and model that. So we can create groups, for example, like the Hearing Voices group, it's really great because we don't actually tackle people's beliefs, but we respect different beliefs, but that creates a culture in the group of holding beliefs more lightly. You know, so we have, we have people with more biological beliefs about mental health, psychosis, schizophrenia, and we have beliefs, people who have very psychological ideas, and we have people who have more spiritual ideas, and, we, we were, and that kind of atmosphere creates this, um, a lot of safety really. Uh, it's not always easy, because uh, we often want people to see things the way we do. Um, but yeah, if we can try to create uh, family networks, support networks, so there's families, um, I like Quaker meetings because of that. They, they, they have that attitude of, of kind of respecting different, um, yeah, respecting different viewpoints. Even Quakers, when somebody gives them an history, we try to tune in. So what's what's the silver lining in this? What's the really helpful thing in this? So we and we don't try to think well, what do I disagree with about this? We, and and there's a feeling that there's something spiritual in everyone, and we need to tune into that. So, um, should we question people's beliefs? Okay. Sometimes there's a time to lean in. So. Um, I have got a slide further on, it's about that. Uh, so a lot of the time we want to be being with people, getting alongside them, um, being non-judgmental, uh, being curious, uh, creative. But at times we might want to lean in and suggest an alternative way of seeing things. Um, and if, if we get resistance, I will back off, perhaps go to empathy, but if you get if the person's willing to, then you could perhaps explore that a different way. So we we can do that, but but if the person's really attached to their belief, then then it might be about you know not challenging it. That's only going to create resistance. And and then can we help them negotiate in the wider world and get on with their life? Lots of people have unusual beliefs and so get on with their life. So how can a person hold it in a way where they don't draw attention to themselves? Um, And one, this bottom thing, mapping the different parts of the person, um, sometimes it can be useful to sort of, this is a kind of Jungian idea that we have rather than one personality, we have different parts. Maybe a part of us holds a strong belief, a different belief to us. And I uh, was with, I spent a lot of time with somebody supporting them and, um, they had a part of them that um, believed in, they, they could um, commit miracles. Um, and we, we named that as a part, the miracle maker. And sometimes when that part of them would come along, and I would say, oh, is that the miracle maker there? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it helped them step back a bit. But it was, and to see it as just a part of the person rather than, oh, they're really unwell at the moment. It's like, no, that part probably comes along when the person needs a bit of a break and, and that part can make them probably feel really important and special. So, um, okay. Just to get me to the end of this lecture. Um, so if somebody is motivated to hold their beliefs more like if somebody's like oh, i believe this sometimes but i want to you know i'm not sure 
I'd like I'd like it not to control me when I believe this. It kind of my world gets really narrow, for example, if it's a persecutory belief. But, um, I guess we tend to, those beliefs tend to come out when we're not feeling safe. So can we help somebody create more safety in their world and their, their relationships? I'm a big fan of nonviolent communication, so that can help create more safety in relationships because it, it moves away from a competitive way of relating or a, a judgmental way of relating, and it can help improve people's relationships. So teaching people nonviolent communication skills, not in a rigid way, but in a creative way, can be helpful. Um, um, and I guess it's always being respectful. So if we if we we don't want to be talking down to somebody, we want to be it's very much equal to sharing ways of seeing the world. Um, and can we can we help the person um, find? Because we're all different. But can we help the person find things that help them look after vulnerable? parts of themselves or help them feel safer and that could be a breathing technique it could be doing taekwondo you know it's so varied and, and broad um, what, what could help ground a person or help them feel feel safe it might be writing um, down how they're feeling it could be doing um, artwork about that um, okay thinking yeah we'll leave it i think we'll leave it there um for now i think so if i go back to a blank slide i'll find a way ron could come in perhaps ask me some questions that have come up all right sounds great oh well, thanks a lot for everything so far by the way about the the slides that you do have um are you would you be interested in making those available to everybody? Like you could send me a copy and then I could forward them to yep. people? Absolutely. Okay. So, so we will do that. Um, let's see. Um, well, one of the questions from Noah was just like, uh, back um, when you were having troublesome beliefs, how receptive do you think you would have been to the, or how do you think you would have reacted to the, the, that curious approach if someone had approached you in that way? Um, I think I would have liked it, yeah. Um, I can remember junior doctors interviewing me about how I saw the world and I got really, I really enjoyed it. Um, felt like I was in a chat show and I wondered if there was a camera filming it secretly. <laughs> uh, and then they never came back and, and it was like disconnect again. So yeah, I, I definitely think um, they hadn't had too much training, so they showed a lot of interest. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we can train that out of people with, with the kind of the, the traditional psychiatric approach, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I know you've answered this somewhat, but um, anything more you can say about how we can avoid kind of like uh, was well, the way Noah put it, how can we avoid patronizing beliefs that may consume a large amount of a person's energy, but which we anticipate will, um, won't go very far in their interactions and um, consensus reality or, or whatever. Um, so how can we avoid um, being patronizing? Yeah. Um, That's quite so, a so, that's quite an in-depth question, isn't it? So, uh, could you say it again? Yeah. Well, how can we avoid patronizing beliefs that may consume a large amount of a person's energy, but which, from a consensus reality perspective, probably won't go anywhere? Like somebody might believe I'm, you know, like I know somebody who believed I'm the Dalai Lama, and if I do blah blah blah, the world will all respond and it'll be wonderful and. You know, yeah. but then maybe we think, well, the world's probably not going to respond very well to that. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess it's trying to help people navigate that. Can they, do they recognize how other people might see the world differently to them? Um, 
and is there a way that they could hold those beliefs that don't doesn't draw attention or doesn't irritate other people so just having frank conversations with people about that i would i would debate the idea of consensus reality because i think we're constantly negotiating that um it's not but maybe he would agree uh, but i just want to emphasize that kind of we're constantly um negotiating what 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 we agree about and, what, and often when we disagree we kind of move away from it but um but yeah i guess having frank conversations with people um yeah and and i i'm honest you know i agree to disagree with people um but 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 i guess if people are getting obsessed and they're pursuing something uh that can be a problem when people are just on some kind of personal um campaign to right the world and what i say to people is look you're better off connecting with others to make changes nobody's ever managed to achieve change on their own um and, and um but yeah what, what will help that person feel safer we're only going to feel more flexible about our versions of reality when we feel more connected with people so is there other ways we can connect with those people um, you know is it through creativity or music or nature um we, we we did we did a retreat once where uh we got back to connecting with nature through mindful activity and green woodworking and um, we had scything we had a scything workshop and there was a guy from a forensic ward doing scything <laughs> and 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 uh, luckily you know we knew him, so we trusted him. We didn't, uh, but that, that's the kind of thing that that takes us into another dimension. You know, doing siding together. You know, we we and and um, and unfortunately, we can lack that creativity once someone's designated as as deluded. Yeah. Um, so there, here's a question: Have you considered the role of the subconscious in forming belief systems? Yeah, I mean, I did mention about dreams, very dreamlike. My my experience is a dreamlike. Definitely, you know, I talked about the magical child might be very, very much connected to our, uh, perhaps more apparent in childhood, but going more into our subconscious as we get older and more active in our dream world. Um, so, yeah, the subconscious for sure. And and I mean, I'm not. And maybe the spirit world, you know, maybe the collective unconscious, maybe we, I know I had a lot of strange experiences in that mind state where things seemed a lot more connected, but it's hard to operate in that world and this world. Yeah. <laughs> Do you say anything more about the, the usefulness of being curious um, to, or how that's actually useful when they, what kind of change that leads to maybe? um yeah i guess people aren't used psychotic experiences what we call psychosis and that's very broad really and for for example like voice hearing um we we often we're not curious about those experiences but in 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 the hearing voices approach we would say oh well how old does he sound Can, have you got a fit have you got an image of this voice that says he's a, a demon, you know, an arch demon or an archangel? What, um, you know, does he sound like anyone you've ever known? Um, does, what, what's his accent? So you start to get curious and the same with, with beliefs. You, oh, have you always held this belief? And, you know, how, how, how do other people respond to it? And what, what so just being curious might be, um when didn't you believe this and what was life like then you know just kind of yeah, yeah there's a lot uh, to explore. creative yeah and not getting fixed on the risk you know yes we need to think about safety but if you get totally fixed on that which is a tendency in our culture it can reduce our curious ability to be curious 
and that you can we can do both we can focus on safety and be curious yeah and Kimberly wonders how were you able to come off the psychotropic medication successfully and um, says I've worked with a sort of community treatment and now working with first episode psychosis and I'm intrigued by by this by your experience yeah um, so I have got a slide on it. Um, I don't know if that's, is it? I could, I could find that slide just to, and, uh, just there's kind of some of my views on medication there, but just to talk to your question was um, what helps me. Um, it's hard coming off medication because it's strong and it sedates. So when you come off, your brain's overactive and there's I could say a lot more about that about dopamine transmitters in the brain and stuff but basically it's good to do it gradually um I the first two times I came off I think my parents kind of panicked and um got me back into hospital as soon as they could more or less um, and the third time I'd left home, so they weren't around to panic so much. And I went through a more crazy period, but without being um, hospitalized again. So uh, my brain had to relearn how to kind of relax in a way. Um, and I used a lot of exercise. That's always what I want. Exercise has been an important way to help me relax. And that's carried on in my life being important as well as more mindful meditation type yogic type stuff um but yeah i think what i haven't mentioned is one of the reasons i think my beliefs became less important um was that i had a good friend who that good friend who was traveling i mentioned came back from traveling and started to visit me nearly every day in hospital and that created a lot more emotional stability for me and a less less of a need for an alternative world because I felt this this being understood and I felt connected uh, and a sense of possibility being part of her social world. Um, and we ended up living together as part of a kind of squatting community. Um, and, and, and they didn't panic when I went through when I was living with them and I went through this kind of high of coming off medication, I came off a depot, um, but they didn't panic. Uh, they grounded me by telling me in no uncertain terms sometimes to leave them alone when I was being a pain, <laughs> but they didn't, uh, they didn't panic. And um, I think I'd, I'd, I'd kind of learned that smoking cannabis wasn't great for me in general, some people find it helpful, but for me, it seemed to make things more complicated. So uh, generally, I avoided cannabis and friends helped me do that as well and, and pass me the joint sort of thing. Um, uh, so yeah, and, and meaningful activity really helped me find stability as well when I, when I came off medication. I was... I had a job where I was a night security guard and I was falling asleep because of the medication. So when I came off, I, I could be more aware and focused. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. And I, I recommend people come off slowly. When you come off a depot, it does come out of your system slowly. So that's quite a good thing, I think. Uh, but I recommend people do it very gradually. And the longer you're on it, the, the more gradually best to come off it. Um, yeah. Great. Do you, um, any other thoughts about how to help people with safety when they're paranoid? Anything you haven't mentioned yet about that? I guess having relationships you trust where you can talk about your fears. Um, and if I'm, you know, I try to be authentic. If I'm supporting somebody, I'll try and be emotionally honest and say how I feel. As well, so I use that nonviolent communication I talked about earlier to, because I I didn't grow up knowing how to talk about my feelings, but that's given me a bit of a language, and I might tell people 
sometimes I might stop someone and say, do you want to know how I'm feeling? You know, you're telling me this about your life. And, and I might. So that creates safety as well, I think. Um, that sort of honesty. And I'm, I'll be honest if I don't agree with how someone's being treated in hospital, for example. Um, um, so, yeah, frank conversations. Um, I think that's it. It's trusting relationships, really. That's how we create safety is through building trusting relationships um, with people. Um, and I think that's why it's, it's really important for mental health professionals or workers to really look after themselves so that you can uh, help, you know, you can be compassionate and you can be grounded and present when people are in crisis and you don't get too defensive because I think that's where we get into trouble, where we get exhausted, whether we're family members or, 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 or workers. And that, that's where we get this disconnect. And, yeah. I mean, there's a lot to a lot of these questions. So I appreciate you yeah. trying to because get the best answer you can. I see we got quite a few of them, but here's an interesting okay. one. Are, are you still a spy as well as a psychologist? Um, <laughs> or did you realize that you weren't a spy? And if so, how did you come to that conclusion? I think John le Carre says we're all spies. Um, but I think it's quite a good metaphor for modern life where we have to perhaps um, deal with agencies we don't agree always share the same values um and whether that's work or other other agencies um governmental organizations whatever so yeah uh, I'm, uh um so it was a powerful metaphor for me training as a psychologist um that, that, that i was kind of infiltrating the mental health system um and uh and i did keep quiet about my former identity as a psychiatric patient until I'd qualified. So it, it was interesting to me that it was a kind of um, repeat in some ways uh, of the, the beliefs I had when I was uh, psychotic. Um, so I think that's a, that's a narrative, that's a um, myth, you know, that's a kind of cult modern cultural myth, you know, the myth of the spy and it can inspire us. But yeah, we've just got to hold it lightly so we don't um, okay. <laughs> uh, take it too far. All right. Well, here's a question. Um, Cody asks, um, how should I talk to um, like peer workers about um, alternative theories when these, these other workers have really rigid beliefs about the medical model? It's another kind of rigid belief, those that our fellow workers yeah. might have. Yeah. That's it. You see, once we get into this way of thinking, then we, we, I think we need to be, I think for a while I was um, very determined just to help people who are seen as psychotic and, and kind of, and I think I've become more interested in how can I create compassionate environments for people to work in so spend as much time with colleagues as with people I'm trying to help and see them as just as important to be compassionate to and to use all these approaches I've talked about so to be to create space mindful spaces for colleagues to create spaces for them to be authentic about how they're feeling and to experience empathy um, so in, in team meetings might do some mindfulness or some creative playfulness at the beginning of team meetings to make them uh, more fun to be in and more grounded and then also having spaces for peers for workers to sit together and um, share how they're feeling reflect on how they're feeling at work um, so yeah, learning from hearing voices groups. We always go around at the beginning of hearing voices group and say how we're feeling, and then we talk about the business. You know, we form an agenda. But try and do that with staff teams as well. Like, how, and I'll model it. So I'll start by saying, you know, I'm feeling quite stressed because I've just had a five, four-hour drive 
from the south of England. Um, and um, I haven't had a chance to find the film I wanted to show today in this presentation. So, um, and I've never done a webinar before, so I'm feeling a little bit anxious. So I'll be really honest. And then that invites other people to be honest. So I think that helps create safety. And then when we're colleagues feel safer, they can hold their beliefs more lightly. Great. Yeah. So Berta asks, how do we invite professionals to tune into their own reactions and assumptions? How do we invite centering someone else's perspectives? I'm sure I understand the last part, but. Um. Uh, I think I, it's the answer to the last question. Goes it's to this kind line. of applies, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's, that's, we model it, you know, we model um, a, a, as well. We, we can be a, a model like I did at the be beginning of a meeting I would do, like sharing our own vulnerability can be helpful um, in a contained way. Um, so yeah, can't think of anything to add to that. Yeah. I think it's kind of similar to the previous question. Yeah. So I think Noah had probably typed this in a while ago, but um, just bring up a particular example of how you might handle it. Like, let's say somebody's telling all their service providers that they're moving out of their rent control department because their ex husband is breaking in. When that's an ex husband that hasn't been seen for decades, how would you respond yeah. to that? Um, with empathy, first of all, really, really like, and want to know more about the relationship and how it was. And I would guess I would, from my psychological part of me, would be thinking this person hasn't processed and had the support from the community to process that relationship. So can we create a safe space to talk about that relationship and understand it? Um, that'd be um, one of the first first things I do. Um, I need to build a relationship with that person. We need to go for coffee or eat food together and um, yeah, find out what will help them feel safer. Um, once you've got a good relationship, somebody might be willing to to re-evaluate what's going on and maybe see that they may be having flashbacks in some ways of, 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 of the persecution they experienced from this person or, or, or some other persecution. Um, so we, we might be able to look at that at some point. Um, we, we're very much guided by the person, what they're feeling comfortable um, talking about. Um, could be that mindfulness could be really helpful. Uh, I worked with somebody who felt under his persecution and um, and I said, well, there are lots of people who experience persecution. They have to look after themselves. How can you, how can we learn some techniques can help you manage the stress you feel under? Um, so people under house arrest, for example, they, or Nelson Mandela, he had to do a lot of self-help strategies to stay stable. Um, and so she was, she was up to doing breathing exercises. She had brilliant imagination for visualization exercises and stuff and found that really helpful. So that could be something. Um, so you lean in, might lean in sometimes and say, look, I'm not sure if this is happening, but if you get a really bad reaction, then it might be about, okay, how can you help me feel safer? So it's, it's a dance really. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. With, with one guy, he, he was, up for he wanted to build a time machine to and so i was curious about that why do you want to build a time machine he wanted to go back to a time when his family members were still alive and he felt responsible for them not being here anymore and he wanted to go back to a time when he could change things um and we ended up doing a kind of psychodrama exercise i'm not training psychodrama but just it kind of fitted with some of the training I've done in voice dialogue. And we ended up, you know, him role playing his mother, and me asking his, his mother if he was to blame for what happened. 
for her death and and she in that role play he could his mother said to him because he was playing his mother um you're not to blame um and that really helped him um and it, there wasn't such a need for the, the the time machine belief but it may have come back at some point i don't know but i my aim wasn't to get rid of the time machine belief, but but, to, but it was it was useful to find out that there was you know unresolved business between him and his parents, and mm. and to work with that with him. Um, so the belief drifted into the background, but that wasn't I wasn't trying to do achieve that. I was just trying to follow the thread of meaning with him. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that, yeah, finding what's really most important to the person and helping that go forward, whether or not they continue to have the belief is often um, yeah. important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Really treading respectfully around these things because they are they're deeply meaningful. And people may have held them for many years and, and they're, they're like old friends. So you can't compete with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, on the other hand, uh, Danielle says, um, I'm curious about working with clients who hold strong religious beliefs like Mormonism in my client's case that prevent growth and change. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, I guess that's, if, if you really believe that, that somehow what they're holding is holding them back, it's kind of a complicated situation, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we might need to find the silver lining in, in that belief that we find challenging. You know, there, there might there must be some positives. I mean, I, I can I can feel that that towards I guess any fundamentalist belief, it can be really challenging to me because it can be very um disowning of you know, very judgmental. And so it's hard, it's hard to support people who have beliefs that we don't share to again um where's the common ground and, and look for that and and um we we might have to accept that some people have beliefs that or it might be racist or homophobic or you know partly because of their religious training or whatever and and or they might be really hard on themselves about their own homosexual part because of what they've been brought up in and that's really hard to witness, but yeah, it's, it's, there's no easy answers really. We, we, um, uh, all I know is, yeah, when, when that environment around somebody feels more accepting and uh, more worth connecting with, we can, we can let go of our rigidly held beliefs. We can, we can hold them more lightly. So we, we have to change the environment around the person and help them find new ways to connect. Might be through with a drama group or Tai Chi or could be a whole range of stuff, animals, working with animals. Or, yeah. Here's a question. Someone says, I'm struggling with a client who is able to talk about her painful beliefs and recognize that they echo her traumatic history. She's currently letting an abusive man stay with her off and on. When he's there, she doesn't hear voices, but he hurts her. She's suffering so badly with him and without him, and we're feeling stuck. <laughs> it's just, hard, just a snapshot, but what does that make you think of when you hear Yeah, could that? you read it again? Because there was a lot in there. Yeah, okay. I got so a bit distracted. Str struggling with a client who, who is able to talk about her painful beliefs and recognize that they echo her traumatic history but she's currently letting an abusive man stay with her off and on. And when he's there, she doesn't hear voices, but then he hurts her. She's suffering so badly, both with him and without him. And so there, she's feeling stuck. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a great believer in power of groups. So as well as one-to-one -one work, I'll, uh, I'll try to, create opportunities for people to uh, attend groups. So sometimes groups can be a good place for people uh, to get support as well as that one-to-one -one with us. But I think through 
building a trusting relationship with somebody, we can give them feedback at some point about how we feel about the relationships they're, they're in and, and question that. Um, but we need that good relationship first. Um, so, uh, and groups can be nice because people can witness other ways of relating in those groups, more respectful ways. Because if we've only experienced abusive ways of relating, then that might feel really safe. So, and, and, and actually <laughs> respectful relationships might feel really unsafe. So I guess we have to gently introduce people to respectful relationships and that takes time um and 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 trust i guess i trust that love um i respectful relationships love kind of ultimately is more attracted to than than the domination relationships of domination but but that it's a gradual unlearning that people need to do um and we need to stick with people if we can and um through that, on that journey. Yeah, um, Robert says, you mentioned identity as a key idea for you. Uh, do you think issues of identity are often present in delusions? Um, and whether religious, ethnic, or national identity, or identity as well or unwell, or, um, or issues around social connections and identity? Yeah, definitely. Definitely is powerful. Um, yeah, Ron, you wrote about it in your blog as well that you talked about, you know, you get these rigidly held tribal beliefs um, and that can really mess us up when we're in a tribal belief system, you know, with others in that tribe and, and we feel we can't breathe in it. And so we, we can either rebel or go into it more, more deeply perhaps. And yeah. But uh, so yeah, cult creating spaces where we can we can talk about that. Like um, I met someone the other day who was from a uh, he's in hospital for the first time, eighteen, like I was. Um, he's from an African country, um, and um, the first thing I did was be curious about the country he was from say I bet it's different to here <laughs> you know <laughs> how do you find it you know I bet people are friendlier there than they are here <laughs> you know um uh that's been my experience um and uh and he was like yeah yeah and it's it just like so important that and we can we can miss that in this very technical approach to that's very dominant in mental health you know, in biology and psychology, we can get very technical, very, and miss the, the, the bigger cultural stuff that's really a play. And, um, you know, just we just touched on, um, I don't know if we touched on it enough, but there's a lot of blame in our culture, and that it's huge. And to, to, to perhaps step back and look at that, about how do we try to live in a society that's so blame? that's so punitive you know that's a that's a kind of mad world we live in mm -hmm. um, um so our identity if we've done something immoral how do we then wrestle with that in this society that's so punitive how do we how do we create a safe space to really make compassionately make sense of that so yeah i think identity is is, is crucial um, right yeah or you like can often identify with jesus because Jesus was misunderstood in his culture. Um, so many of us have, have believed we messianic and Jesus-like because he he um, he can epitomize that 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 sense of being judged um, unfairly. Yeah. So so Scott's asking, tell us more about uh, the mapping and parts work and what that would look like in meeting with a person. Yeah, uh, I guess um, the idea is that we have different, like more adult parts and more childlike parts. We 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 can give them our own names. So it's partly for, I've learned it from. I know there are other therapeutic models, but I've learned it from the the sort of self development model. Uh, Helen Sidra Stone voice dialogue. This idea that you can 
give parts different names. So we might have a comic, we might have a imaginative part, we might have a responsible adult part, we might have a rebel. And that that can be a useful way to think about ourselves and that at different points, different parts of us can be at the front, can be in, in the driving seat. And how can we learn to better understand those parts and, and um, negotiate with them so they don't completely take us over. Um, so, yeah, um, I spoke recently with somebody who um, has a part of them that will self-harm and, and letting that part speak and talk about how self-harm is a really good distraction from, from, from emotional pain. Uh, and, and that's why she does it. Um, gives it another pain to think about. It's like, we used to say that, you know, how, what do I do about this sore knee? Well, I'll kick your other knee. It's a bit like that, you know, um, give me some of that. And, but it was, it's just so kind of clear then that, that, that this is a, a useful strategy. So by talking to a part of the person, we could get a very compassionate understanding of, of something, uh, of something a bit taboo in our society. And, um, and then it's like, how can we help that part feel safer? Um, and this person, that part, the self-harming part, uh, likes boxing. So that gets relief from that. So that's a number, something we could build on. Um, so giving voice to different parts of ourselves, that, that could, could, could work. And people, I guess awareness is something we slowly build. It's not something that can happen overnight. This is gradual work I'm talking about. But, but we can learn to, you know, I've got a defensive part that can get a bit paranoid. And learning when that's about, okay, you know, I've got a part that can blame everybody else for my problems. Um, so the other day I was in a dance class and I did a turn and I fell over. <laughs> and I was like, who moved the floor? <laughs> so that's how good part of me is at, at blaming other people and <laughs> the environment. <you> know? <laughs> and that, that, that's something I've learned in my family, in my culture, that, that if it doubt, blame someone else. <laughs> but when that part's at the front, I know that I'm not going to be careful because it, that part won't take responsibility for anything. <laughs> and it won't be good in relationships. <laughs> It might make me feel better for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's maybe it was intended to be kind of a challenging remark um, because Bert is saying lawyers are taught to only ask questions they know the answer to. Um, yeah. And posing a curious question when you believe you already know is not respectful. Yeah. True. Good reminder. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the kind of curious question we're talking about is curious about stuff you really don't know. Um, yeah. Like, why does the person believe something? You know, they believe it, but why do they? Or what are some details about it? They might not have even thought about questions. the details yet. Open-ended questions, you know, like, how long have you believed this? What's, <clears throat> you know, how do you feel when you, when, when you've realized this? Um, right. You know, just open, yeah, we don't, I agree that there's a danger, there's, I think, there can be some therapeutic approaches where we have a sense we're asking questions to get to a certain destination, and, and that's kind of, and this is much more about, I've got a map, they've got a map, let's just share ideas, which way are we going to go here, I don't know, I've got a few ideas, you know, I've got a compass, they've got a map, and can we, can we work this out together? Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely not assume you know the answers to questions you're answering, asking, and then it's not, it's not genuine. And I, and I would also say the reason way it's different from lawyers is lawyers don't ask open-ended questions because something might come up that doesn't help their case. But in our case, or in our like when, in our work with people, we don't necessarily know where the work is going. We're just trying to find out where it should go. So as we learn more, then we can figure out you know, we can help people figure out what they want to do. We don't know in advance what people should be doing. 
Sometimes we don't even yeah. know whether their belief they're telling us is true or not. Yeah, you know, we might yeah. think their ex has been gone for 10 years, but maybe they're right that their ex is coming back around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's a true dialogue is you don't know, you're exchanging understandings and moving to new understandings. You don't have a sense. Whereas a monologue, you kind of trying to convince the other person of your point of view. We're trying to move away from that. Yeah. And Bethany says, as a mental health nursing student, we are always reminded that we should challenge people if we don't quite understand or disagree with practices that staff are following. How would you politely challenge colleagues? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, uh, politely challenged with humor sometimes. Sometimes um, talk about my own experience is a good way. One to one, so rather than doing it in a group, sometimes I'll challenge things in a group. But what I might do there in a group, I might do it before something happens. So I'll say. Um, I've noticed in this meeting there's been a tendency to talk about people in terms of their diagnoses. Um, could we talk about them as people rather than as diagnoses? Because I, I find that a lot more humanizing. Um, and you know, I feel uncomfortable if you start to talk about people as objects. Um, so I'd say it before the meeting starts. Uh, so yeah, thinking carefully about if you shame someone, they tend to go back and hold their position stronger. So how can we, as the questioner put it, how can we challenge in a way, how can we um, challenge in a way that doesn't create shame? Um, humor is a good way. If we've got a good relationship, we can lean in on someone a bit more. Um, yeah, there's a few ideas, but yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah. So, um... Here's a question. Um, are there ways in which your kind of hearing voices network sort of approach and a psychological approach con conflict, have a conflict? Well, there are many psychological approaches. So, uh, you know, as many psychological approaches as there are psychologists. <laughs> um, yeah. So, ooh. I think... Yeah. The Hearing Voices Network can be challenging because it's it's sort of saying we need to accept different versions of reality. So in a group, we would we'd accept if somebody said their voices were ancestors or something. We'd see that that's got some validity, some value, and we'd respect. Um, so I think that can be challenging to some psychologies. That idea that. Uh, I think in psychology, we, we might want to reduce something to a psychological understanding. What I try to do now, and I do have a psychologist in me, so I do have my psychological biases, but for example, helping someone who hears his voices, say they think their voices are demons. I might think they're psychological entities rather than spiritual entities, but actually what help, the most important thing is helping that person change the power relationship with that, that, that entity, that being, that, that voice. Uh, and a psychologist might get into trying to make it psychological and convince the person it's part of themselves. And sometimes I will do that. But if somebody's attached to that not being part of themselves, I'm more interested. The most important thing I should be focusing on, I think, is how can I make that relationship one where they've got choices? where they feel they've got some power in the relationship and not get into psychological reductionism that you've got. And, and I don't know if the voice is a demon or not. Um, I don't know if demons and negative schemas are, are the same, are two different ways of talking about some, the same thing, you know, or, or disown self is, is, is actually, you know, and demon are just two different frameworks, but we're talking about a similar thing. I don't know. I think uh, so. I think perhaps with the hearing voices approach, the way I interpret it, we might just hold our own frameworks 
lightly, where some psychologists might be very clear that it's the unconscious here, or it's, it's you know, it's people's, you know, um, a projection. This is clearly a projection. You know, actually, I think we need to be humble about our models. They're just mod they're just maps, just like, just like the Maoris have maps. Yeah. Just, I just want to do a time check right now. We've kind of used up the time we said we would use. Um, yeah. We could end it now, or Rufus, if you wanted to keep, you know, talking and answering questions, and people are. No, I, I are think boundary is good. Um, I've got something in twenty minutes that I need All to right. get grounded for um, a meeting. Um, but it's been very nice. Thank you. I hope it's been meaningful for people, and uh, thank you, Ron, for organizing it. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for showing up and, and being, you know, here and sharing this approach. Um, there's uh, a lot more we can all learn, but I think you've really gotten us a good start. And I see a lot of people are typing in their thank yous. So, yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of websites there um, with some resources on. I'm sure, Ron, you have your website as well and the ISPS websites. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd share those. Thanks. Thanks everyone. All right. Um, yep. Okay.